So in the last video, we talked about generation from light. And in this video, I'm going to talk about recombination and generation from thermal processes. And specifically, we're going to take a look at uh, just the indirect process, so uh, RG center or indirect thermal. I can spell uh, recombination and the reason we're taking a look at this specifically is because this turns out to be the dominant mechanism in most semiconductors or at least in the semiconductors that we're interested in studying so remember that RG center recombination if we've got our conduction band and our valence band here we've got some states some states somewhere in the band gap where there shouldn't be any states they're at a certain energy uh, and these states are called traps. So they're caused typically by uh, imperfections in the silicon lattice. So we might have this large uh, just atom of gold sitting where we want an atom of silicon and that kind of disrupts the lattice structure. And that creates these traps where there really shouldn't be any. Um, so we're gonna take a look at the behavior of uh, an N-type semiconductor first. And you might say, well, why are we taking a look at a specific kind of semiconductor? Why not um, Why not just the, a generic semiconductor? And the reason turns out to be one of tractability. And this is a really important uh, concept in engineering and physics. A lot of processes are really complicated uh, and we cannot develop equations for them, or at least solvable equations, uh, if we don't make certain assumptions. And so that's that's sort of why we're why we're starting from here. So if it's an n-type material, we know that its Fermi level will be up top. And actually, let me just draw that in in blue to make that absolutely explicit. We know we'll have a bunch of electrons in the conduction band. It's just an, ele an electron party because we've got a bunch of conductors that came up from the uh, from the states introduced by the donor atoms. Uh, so we've got a ton of electrons and then we've got a couple holes. And we've only got a couple holes, remember, because uh, because of the n naught p naught product. Uh, because the more electrons we have, the more likely holes are to recombine with them. So we don't have nearly as many holes as we have electrons. And for this reason, we want to study the hole dynamic. So how do the holes operate in an n-type semiconductor. And again, the reason we're doing this is for reasons of tractability. Uh, it'll turn out that if we study the minority carriers uh, or the carriers that there's far fewer of in uh, silicon, then we can come up with a differential equation that's both linear and solvable. Well, it's solvable because it's linear. So we're interested in finding a differential equation, uh, dp dt, that describes how the hole's concentration changes with time. And first, we're going to analyze this at equilibrium. So we know that the hole concentration is just p naught. We know the electron concentration is n naught. And here, since this is an n-type semiconductor, n naught is just approximately equal to the donor concentration, and p naught is just equal then to ni squared divided by the donor concentration. So if we want to know how the number of holes is changing with time, uh, well, at equilibrium, we expect it to be zero, right? So we expect our recombination processes, so dp, dt, uh, recombination, that R stands for recombination, to be equal to the negative of the processes due to generation. So we expect, in other words, this is just a differential equations way of saying, we expect the number of holes created to equal the number of holes destroyed at equilibrium. And so how do we find the number of holes destroyed? Well, we know that these traps, uh, if they have available states, uh, since the Fermi level is way up here, and this represents the level that an electron will occupy that level, uh, with probability of one half if there were any states there. The electrons down here are occupying these states with probability of almost one. So we've got a bunch of electrons filling these trap states. There's almost no empty trap states. And so these holes uh, are able to recombine 
with these traps, if you will, and remove uh, effectively the electron that was in the trap. Or you can think of it as the electron from the trap jumping down into the valence band. The two pictures are equivalent, uh, but either way, we're losing one charge carrier. So these electrons inside the traps aren't able to conduct charge by themselves. So we expect the uh, rate of change or the recombination rate to be, obviously it's gonna be negative because we're destroying holes. So we expect the change in holes to be negative. Uh, and we expect it to be proportional to the number of traps. Uh, and that's just because, well, the more opportunities these holes have to recombine, uh, the more likely they are to do so. Uh, we also expect it to be proportional to the total number of holes, P, uh, which at equilibrium is just P naught. Um, and we also, we, we don't, other than that, we're fairly ignorant. We don't know what other things might be affecting this system. So we're just gonna do what physicists and engineers do and just throw in a constant there. And this is just a constant of proportionality. And constants uh, almost always just represent our ignorance. So we, we're saying we don't want to do uh, super in-depth quantum mechanical and statistical mechanical analysis of this. So we're just going to throw in a constant and make certain assumptions. Well, okay, uh, so this is going to be our overall recombination rate. And since we know the generation rate at equilibrium is just the negative of this, uh, we can say that dp dt due to generation is just negative negative becomes positive uh, the number of traps or the concentration of traps uh, times p naught times this constant of proportionality cp and so that is uh, that is our complete analysis at equilibrium and if we just do a sanity check uh, dp dt due to recombination is just negative dp dt due to generation at equilibrium, that's true. Um, these are just each other's negatives. Um, so what if we're interested at about in non-equilibrium? So we've still got our conduction band. We've still got our valence band. Uh, we've got an, a, a bunch of electrons up here just having a party. Uh, and we've got a couple holes down here, a little more lonely. And we've still got our trap states at some energy ET. We don't know what that energy is, but we're pretty sure it's within the band gap. Uh, we've still got our Fermi level up here, EF. And let's say we add a bunch of holes. So let's say we add three holes. And let's say we also add three electrons. Now, in reality, we're going to be adding like 10 to the 14 electrons and 10 to the 14 holes. and these uh, adding additional electrons to a strongly n-type semiconductor uh, doesn't appreciably change the concentration, but it greatly changes the concentration of holes. So this, uh, this condition where we don't appreciably change the majority carrier concentration, but we do appreciably change the minority carrier concentration is called low level injection. And all it's saying is that, well, if we've got uh, say 10 to the 17 electrons per cubic centimeter at thermal equilibrium and 10 to the two or 10 to the three then holes, uh, well, if we add 10 to the 14 to each of these numbers, so add 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 3, 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 17, then 10 to the 17 isn't going to change much. It's still going to be about 10 to the 17. But 10 to the 3 is going to change to 10 to the 14. So this low-level injection condition allows us to make, uh, basically, it, it lets us make life much, much easier for ourselves. And so we don't expect the generation to change uh, under this condition. So we still expect the dp, dt, the generation process to just be nt times p naught times cp. And the reason for that is because we don't expect the spontaneous generation of holes to be dependent 
on the concentration of holes. We expect the recombination process to be dependent on it because the holes have to meet up with an electron and the more holes there are, the more opportunities they have to meet. But with generation, it's, it's independent of this, uh, of the concentration at, uh, at a different, uh, at a different non-equilibrium concentration. But we expect recombination the recombination process, like I said, to be dependent on the number of holes. So instead of P naught, we have P, where P is just the total number of holes uh, times this constant of proportionality. So now if we're interested in the total amount of both recombination and generation, uh, we can just add these two up and we'll see that dp dt is just minus nt times p times cp plus nt times p naught uh, times cp. And we can just rewrite this as minus delta p times nt cp, where delta p is just p minus p naught. So I just factored out the nt cp. And this delta p is going to turn out to be really important in analyzing uh, n-type semiconductors. So our differential equation that we're eventually going to formulate is going to be in terms, in general, of delta p. So in total, uh, we have this differential equation, del p del t is equal to minus delta p times nt cp. But again, <laughs> I think you know what's coming next. So this constant of proportionality has units of 1 over time. Uh, and so we're just going to replace these two with a single constant, tau p. So in an n-type semiconductor, in conclusion, the, our, the differential equation that we've created is dp dt is just equal to minus delta p over tau p. So our equation only depends on the minority carrier concentration, and it only depends on the change in minority carrier concentration. So that change can be due to exciting the semiconductor with light, it can be due to increasing the temperature, it can be due to a bunch of different things. And if we went through the same analysis for an n-type or for a p-type semiconductor, so this is for an n-type semiconductor, if we went through the same process for a p-type semiconductor, we'd get that, well that should be a should be an n, not a t, not a p we'd get that the change in minority carrier concentration n with respect to time is just minus delta n over tau n. Another really nice thing about these constants tau n and tau p is that they can actually be measured. Uh, so our differential equations can model a semiconductor accurately based on measured values. And so again, remember that this these differential equations are kind of opposite of what you'd expect in that we're looking at the minority carrier concentration. So in p-type materials, we're looking at the change in electrons. In n-type materials, we're looking at the change in holes. So this is the general approach that we're going to take in the future, and this is the, the equations that we're going to develop are going to be surrounding these changes in minority concentration.